computer madam and money madam as well. Kamath madam and money madam. And don't uh, make noise when things are going on. Don't call the Hello. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. 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 Oh, my, this one is coming as Yukti Misale. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning, madam. Ravi Kumar. Right. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Please mute yourself. Mute everything. ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಪರ್ಮಿಷನ್ ಏನೊಂದಿಲ್ಲ very very good morning to one and all on behalf of management of kelly society belgavi karnataka india principal and staff of raja lakamgoda science institute autonomous belgavi it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all to the international webinar organized by iqac and department of botany on genetically modified cotton plants produce tocotrienols important vitamin e components for added nutritional and medicinal value so on this occasion firstly i welcome our bill of principal dr v d ermali and request sir to address you all sir good morning one and all it is the great pleasure to welcome you all for the international webinar on genetically modified cotton plants produce tocotrienols and uh, their applications 
in nutritional and medicinal value it is our privilege to welcome you all participants resource persons and teachers who have logged in on this occasion we are very pleased with your overwhelmed response by registering yourself to this webinar you are all now logged into one of the prominent educational organization on the world map karnatak lingayat education society with great pride and privilege we are organizing such events to showcase the talent involved in our staff the zeal to communicate knowledge to the deserved ones students teachers and other educational organizations it's all because of the support always provided enthusiastically and motivated by our board of directors headed by the chairman none other than always working with very futuristic ideologies dr prabhakar kore he is giving inputs to make the staff and students of the organization always think out of box and have their own contributions in making the events teaching and learning meaningful so indeed we are all privileged to work under him since last 35 to 40 years after he is taking the helm of affairs as chairman of board of directors karnatak lingayat education society it has grown without any comma forget about full stop still it is continuing testimony is more than 270 institutions under the umbrella of kle covering the area from kindergarten to post graduation medical field including treatment and hospital facilities to the deserved and poor one engineering technology nursing so on and so forth where you feel teaching is possible learning is provided there you will find any one of the kle institutes this is how the vision of our chairman and board of directors is making era wherever we feel it is apt to enter and provide the facilities so also is the raja lakham goda science institute we are very proud to share that our today's speaker dr shanmukh salimat is a distinguished alumnus of this institute we have one more guest logged in dr vishnupant misale who is working in isro a retired scientist and the main brain behind mission to mars is also an alumnus of this institute this simply speaks how raja lakham goda science institute is giving the outputs to society at larger to teaching community in particular including research 
field. Since last 85 years of inception of Raja Lakhamboda Science Institute, we are working always towards going for new ventures. Since 2010, Raja Lakhamboda Science Institute, fondly called as RLS in this area, is working under autonomous field that has made us to catalyze the activities, enhance the involvement to the fraternity of teachers, joining them, linking them to the student facilities all over, not only in India, all over the world. That is how the testimony is today's international webinar. We are all very much privileged to join with you. And once again, I welcome all of you with a brief introduction of the organization called KLE and an institution called RLS. Thank you one and all. Namaste. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yes, the main intention of this webinar is to learn more about genetically modified cotton plants that produce tocotrienols, an important component of vitamin E, which is very much essential for the proper functioning of the body, especially as an antioxidant. It plays an important role in the cell defense system and to battle against various elements such as oxidative stress, cancer, anti-aging, and many others. Thus, the main objective of this webinar is to know about tocotrienols and also to raise public awareness of the role of dietary antioxidants in maintaining better health that would benefit a number of lives. With this, today's topic. Yes, for this webinar, we are very fortunate to have amidst us distinguished speaker, our alumnus, Dr. Shanmuk S. Salimat, research scientist, grade one, Department of Biological Sciences, Biodiscovery Institute, University of North Texas. Sir has completed his graduation with botany as major subject from Kiali Society's RL Science Institute, Belgavi in the year 1983. Post-graduation from PG studies in botany from Karnataka University, Dharwad with specialization in cytogenetics and plant breeding in the year 1985. Sir has done his PhD in plant cytogenetics from Karnataka University, Dharwad in the year 1992. From 1990 to 1992, Sir has worked as a research associate in the Department of Botany, University of Delhi, India, and worked on in vitro micropropagation and molecular biology of tree species. From 1992 to 1995, Sir has worked as postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Biological Sciences, Purdue University, West Lafayette, and worked on maize, molecular biology, and genetics. From 1995 to 1998, as postdoctoral research associate at Plant Biology Division, the Samuel Roberts Nobel Foundation, Ardmore, and worked on soybean molecular biology and genetics from 1999 to 2000 as a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Plant Pathology, University of California, Riverside, and worked on uh, oomycetes of fungal genetics. From 2001 to 2008, as an agricultural research laboratory manager for wheat breeding and genetics program, Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, and Department of Plant Pathology, Washington State University, and there he has carried out research project on DNA marker technology for wheat quality traits and market class identification. And since 2008 to date, Sir is working as research scientist grade one, Department of Biological Science, Biodiscovery Institute, University of North Texas Dental, where he is carrying out research on improvement of applied cotton for biotic and herbiotic stress, higher seed oil and fiber production through genetic engineering. 
He has technical expertise in plant tissue culture and genetic transformation, molecular biology and genetic engineering, microbiology and plant genetic and cytogenetics. Sir has participated in and presented several papers in international and national seminars and conferences. He has published several papers in both international and national journals of high repute. Mm -hmm. Sir, we are really, I mean, we are really very fortunate to have such a versatile personality to address our international webinar. Sir, just, I would like to share with you that I'm really very happy to say we have received overwhelming response from 14 different countries, mm -hmm. namely Italy, Australia, UK, USA, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Mexico, Egypt, Pakistan, Bahrain, Philippines, Bangladesh, Iraq, and Nepal. So on behalf of everyone, sir, I extend a warm welcome to you. I now welcome everyone and we just will move on to this session. I give the platform to Dr. Shanmuk, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Kowal, Dr. Kowalkar. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to have you all uh, over here in the webinar. And also I thank the organizers, Professor Bagi, who is the convener, uh, Dr. Kawalikar and yourself as head of the Department of Botany and uh, Dr. Badagavi uh, as the IR, IQAC coordinator and the principal BDL uh, I really appreciate you all uh, inviting me to this webinar. And uh, I give my special thanks to you for such a detailed introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to uh, start with my seminar. It is, it is almost 11.20 in the United States here. So uh, I would like to start with my seminar. That is genetically modified plants produce tocotrienols that are important components of vitamin E uh, for nutritional and medicinal value. Uh, when I gave this uh, title uh, to Dr. Kowalikar, she suggested a little bit, my earlier version of the title was a little different. She suggested a little modification. So I came up with the word nutritional and medicinal value, but I'm not a nutritional scientist or a researcher. So I tried to justify with the work we have done, uh, you know, where we can prove that uh, we have a little bit of something to speak about nutrition and medicinal value in the work we have been doing. Uh, so I understand, I'm unable to, I am unable to move the slides. Can you, all, do you have control please? Uh, sir, just a minute, stop, uh, share screen and uh, click, click it again. What, what I do now? Okay. Okay. Still not working. Okay. Can you all see the screen now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I understand there are a lot of people uh, uh, attending this seminar or webinar, uh, people from other backgrounds other than plant sciences. So I'd like to start with, uh, you know, where uh, humanity, human beings have been dependent on plants for a lot of things uh, like food, clothes, shelter. Here is a cartoon showing on the left here, showing a man 
ancient man building his shelter out of wood, sticks, plant sticks. And here in the middle is a linen string a fabric made of uh, the flax plant. This is from a museum somewhere in Denmark, uh, dating back to more than 3000 years. And on the right top is a Amazon rainforest boy carrying a bunch of bananas, you know, showing that though they are isolated from the rest of the world, they still depend on, you know, for their food, the banana plants. And here on the corner left, right side at the bottom, you see a bunch of folks working in the field. This is, this shows the improvement. This is a, there was a study in science in 2018 showing that migration and movement of people along with their cultures, you know, uh, help develop agriculture in a kind of community, communal, as a communal property rather than individuals. So this all gives an indication that how humanity or the human beings are dependent on plants for food, clothes, and then shelter. Uh, here I'm sharing you a slide which shows a lot of things, which is can't see anything at all, but it does a lot of things. It is a cell, it is a plant cell showing a lot of metabolic pathways where the things that we eat, drink, whatever, uh, you know, they're all, especially the plant-based ones, they come from a lot of reactions. The plant cell is the biggest manufacturing factory, you know, other than uh, whether it's living, whether it is a plant or animal, living cell is the biggest factory that can, you know, uh, produce as ma produce much more than what man can produce. Okay, so with little, you know, tidbits here with the reference to plants, and then I would like to move to my seminar that is uh, on cottons. And that what we are trying to do is produce tocotrienols in the cotton plants. Uh, as you can see from this picture here, you have cotton bowl, the mature cotton bowl at the top here. Cotton bowl contains uh, the fruit, the matured fruit. When it matures, you see uh, open fiber hidden are the seeds inside. So this fiber and seed are very economically important part of the cotton plant. And then they, part, they enter two industry lines, one textile that the fiber and the seed enters the food and the animal feed. So we all know that what is made of cotton fiber, for example, here in our cloth jeans, and then here cotton seed helps us in uh, producing edible oil and then and also animal feed that this is the coconut cake or the uh, which is used as animal feed. Okay, uh, coming to this um, next slide is what is Gossypium? What is gossip? The, we all talk about cotton. Cotton. What is cotton? Cotton belongs to the genus Gossypium botanically. Okay, so cotton has about fifty-one species, and majority of them are diploids, and only four species are tetraploids. And interesting thing is that. There are four, four species that Gossypia arboreum, herbaceum, histotum, and bogardens. These are the four species that are cultivated for fiber uh, or seed. And we commonly term them all as cottons. So here, what we are seeing is Gossypia arboreum, herbaceum, or the two diploid species. They are of Indo-African in origin, uh, where they were cultivated. Probably our ancestors in uh, Indian subcontinent and still in uh, some parts, and so also in Africa, it is th those two species are cultivated. Whereas the hirsutum and the barbadans are the American cottons, they are American in origin. So these are cultivated in the United States. Hirsutum is uh, commonly here in the United States, is called upland cotton. And the earliest records of this cotton go back to 3000 years from the Yucatan province of the Mexico. Whereas the Barbadan species is extra long staple cotton, also called as Pima cotton or the Egyptian cotton. Pima comes from the Native Americans who cultivated this Barbadan species, so the name Pima. 
So also the Egyptian, because Egyptians cultivated the same species as well. Where, the, where does it come from? The, this originates from the Real Alto on the coast of Ecuador, about 4,000. The available records show that it is in existence, at least in that area, for 4,400 years. However, the first evidence of cotton used was from India around 5,000 BC. So it's believed that cotton was first cultivated in the Indus Delta and at, and at present three countries, that is India, USA and China are the largest producers of cotton in the world. Archaeological carbon, uh, you know, dating us data also so show that it is cotton was introduced from India to China about 2000 years ago. Here is the a slide showing the origin and evolution of the present day cotton versus the old diploid species, old in the sense that those are the diploid species, they existed in old world, they are still cultivated, but majority in the world all over today, what is cultivated is the hirsutum species, which is the uh, upland cotton. So what we know is that upland cotton, I just explained it's a tetraploid, uh, so how did it come originate from? Origin, it originated from the wild A genome donor herbaceum and the D genome donor remanti. These two species cross, chromosome doubling happened, chromosome doubling led to selection by humans, domestication, and then what we have today is the hirsutum tetraploid species. And you can down, you can see here, it's the cultivated A2 labeled as, this is the arboreum wild species, uh, sorry, ar arboreum cultivated species in the Indian continent. Okay, so what we have here is the, what we have here is the leading cotton producing countries in the world and then how much do they produce? For example, in the year 2018-19, India was the largest producer of cotton with uh, followed by United States and China. And the remaining almost 10 countries, which are not so much as, as far as the world output is concerned. Okay, uh, so this slide, what I'm trying to show is, uh, is where where uh, in the United States cotton is grown. Cotton is grown in the southern parts of the United States. These are 17 states that is popularly called as cotton belt. Uh, in the United States, the Texas is the largest producer of cotton, uh, the state I live in. And uh, say on the west coast, California and the adjoining state, Arizona produce the Lima cotton or the Barbadon species cotton. Sorry, I'm stuck again. Okay, uh, it's mode. Okay, so this is the chart showing that uh, how much of cotton is produced in the United States with reference to each state, largest producing states. And again, uh, showing that Texas is the largest producer of cotton. And in terms of dollar value, uh, it is almost six to seven billion dollar value in, uh, in terms of uh, cotton fiber. Uh, how about uh, the cotton seed? Cotton seed, about 590 million pounds of cotton seeds is produced in the United States. So the cotton seed that we produce is used for oil. Cotton seed oil consists 26% uh, of the palmitic acid 
2% stearic acid, 15% oleic, and 55% linoleic acids. And uh, this is the study from uh, 1996, and then it is further confirmed and uh, supported by other researchers. So cotton seed is, uh, this on the right side, what you see is organic pure cotton seed oil from the Gossypium herbaceum, whereas on the left is the Gossypium uh, hirsutum. Okay, in addition to, in addition to, uh, in addition to the oils, what does cotton seed contain? Cotton seed oil contains the tocochromanols. What is tocochromanol? Tocochromanols are the tocopherols and the tocotrienols together form the tocochromanols. Oh. In generic term, it is vitamin E. Uh, they occur in eight natural forms and each occurs in four different forms. That is alpha, beta, gamma, tocopherol and tocotrienols the same, alpha, beta, gamma, and uh, delta trienols. Tocochromanols are potent antioxidants and they protect cell walls, uh, protect cells against oxidative stress. And antioxidant feature of these tocochromanols contributes to the nutritive value of food products and animal feeds. Tocotrienols possess powerful neuroprotective and anti-cancer and cholesterol lowering properties, uh, often not exhibited by tocopherols. So tocotrienols are becoming more popular and there is not much of a study on them. Because of their medicinal value, tocotrienols are commercially produced as nutraceuticals. Trouble again. This bar has to be the problem. Okay. Uh, here are the commercially sold tocotrienols packaged into bottles and sold as vitamin E. Uh, where do they come from? They occur in plants, tocotrienol and tocopherols occur in plants. Tocopherols occur mostly in all plant parts and especially in all monocots and dicots. And then uh, they are components of seed oils. So for example, if you, you, if you use uh, nuts, especially walnut, pistachio, and things like that, and then including cotton seeds, for example, they have a lot of toco uh, furrows. Uh, uh, this is the example of a wheat germ showing, uh, and then this is the safflower uh, seeds, sunflower seeds. And where do tocotrienols come from? Tocotrienols, they occur very, very limited uh, in plants, but they are found in mostly in monocot and monocots and palm oil of the major, you know, palm oil is the major commercial source of these uh, tocotrienols. They are also known to occur in some dicots, but not all. So cotton seeds completely lack tocotrienols. This is one of the objectives that we try to introduce this tocotrienol pathway into the cotton through genetic engineering. How do they differ, tocotrienol and tocotrienol? The, they are, one is the saturated, one, the other one is the unsaturated version. So there, were, there, are, there is an increased interest by the med medical field and the doctors working, doctors and the scientists working in a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, dangerous diseases such as cancer and other chronic diseases showing that tocotrienols play a very, very important role in uh, curing those diseases, cure all health, or helping those diseases. And these are some of the important researchers from Anderson Cancer Research Center in uh, Texas. Uh, and similarly, another article from 
Ohio Medical Center. Here, what I'm showing is this is the metabolic strategy that was devised how one can make plants to produce, how one can produce tocotrienols. Here is a Cahoon's pa paper in Nature Biotechnology who demonstrated that he engineered. Um, the excuse engineered me, sir. He engineered plants. Sir, your screen has not been shared. Sorry? Your screen has not been shared. You need to click it there. I am sharing it. Uh, no, sir. It's not visible, sir. It is on. Sir? The screen is frozen. Can you all see now? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Okay. So this is the metabolic strategy to direct trochotrienol accumulation in the uh, plants. So for example, the expression of homogenate general general transferase enzyme, which helps, in, which is the enzyme which is responsible for the production, which en the enzyme catalyzes the commuter step in tocotrienol biosynthesis. By using this strategy, Cahoon et al. in uh, 19, 2003 were able to show that tobacco and tobacco and herbalopsis, when they transformed the plants with this construct of HGGT, they were able to show that vitamin E was able to accumulate about 10 to 15 fold over non-transgenic plants. But it's not me, I can't change my Okay. 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 Uh, so what is, uh, how is it demonstrated? Cloning of the HGGT, that is homogenate general general transferase cDNA from the barley that was cloned into uh, a binary vector pecan under the control of Brassica napin promoter and uh, transferred to agrobacterium. Okay, so this is the binary vector designed for the trans plant transformation. Uh, this is the napin promoter under the control of napin promoter HGGT sequence from barley. And when you transform this, that construct into, into uh, plants, they would be uh, producing HGGT through HGGT, they will be producing tocotrienols. And Dr. Cahoon shared this construct with us and then we tried to go ahead with the transformation of the cotton plants. And cotton transformation is a very tedious and difficult long process which involves uh, basically uh, generation of the callus, the callus to somatic embryogenic cells and then you do co-culture of the somatic embryogenesis with the agrobacterium and then transform the uh, move the transformed uh, cells to MSMK media or the, along with the antibiotics. And then once you have this culture and subculture going on, you see the em somatic embryogenic uh, em embryos popping up and then you select them and then move them again and then uh, allow them to grow. And then what you have is the transgenic plants and those transgenic plants are moved to the soil and then acclimatized and then transferred to the greenhouse for seed production. So this is a simple uh, protocol 
uh, where you take the seeds, uh, treat with sulfuric acid, and then germinate in a sterile condition in a, a petri plate, and then allow them to germ grow. And then this is about a one week old plant. And then once you have these expanded cartilidins, what you do is you basically uh, culture them on a, on a non-selection media to produce calli. These are the calli, a one month old calli, and then you culture, subculture, keep going, and then until you produce a massive amount of callus. This callus is, again, uh, subcultured into liquid media in order to produce embryogenic cells. These embryogenic cells are co-cultured with the, the binary vector that contains a gene of interest. In our case, it is HGGT from barley. So once you have those co-cultured cells going on in a selection media, you have these small plantlet somatic embryos popping up and those somatic allow them, culture them, subculture them. And then what we have is plants coming out of the culture. And these are in the magenta boxes. These are, you allow those tiny plants to grow and put up two to three, four leaf stage. and move them to the greenhouse. And what we have here is the T1 plants or the transgenic plant producing flowers and fruits. And then this is in cotton, it is the cotton bowl, uh, which contains the seeds and the fiber. And we, uh, these are the T1 plant. These are from the T1 plants and the, the bottom here in the bottom right side corner is flower and fruit from the advanced stages of the plants. Uh, how do we know that we have produced transgenic plants? Though we have subjected them to selection, antibiotic selection, and then they have gone through rigorous selection, but still there can be escapes or false positives. So what we do is we genotype them with a specific primers, in this case, HGGT specific primers. Here we have number of plants that are confirmed showing that uh, HGGT specific primers amplifying a DNA of about 593 base pairs here. And then in order to check that all the plants, what we have is the DNA is working. You check with uh, an, a home housekeeping gene that is common to all the plants. So, so here in this case, say for example, the actin genes amplifying a product of 390 base pairs. And these are the primary transgenics. We produce number of transgenics and we selected only two to move on. And then those two plants were advanced to further generations. And this is again, say for example here, this is the T2 plants uh, confirming at the about 50 plants being confirmed with the same TCR technology showing an expected band of 593 bases. Here are the plants in the greenhouse. These are all gone through screening, initial screening of TCR and gone, gone through different stages of development. Here are, these are the two month old plants. These are like a three month old likewise. And these are flowering, fruiting, all that. Here, what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a look at the transgenic plants and the wild type, the non wild type means the non transgenic control, check at the uh, photosynthesis, ra photosynthesis rate in them using the uh, LICOR uh, photosynthetic apparatus. So, what we did is we looked at the Two, old, two week old and four week old plants subjected to photosynthesis analysis. What we see here is when the plants are young, we looked at top layer and the middle layer. Uh, so top as well as the middle layer basically responding in the same fashion in the sense they are showing the same rate of photosynthesis. As the time advances, the top layer or the, or the uh, the top layer and the bottom layer show showed differences in the accumulation of photosynthetics, showing that the cotton plant is of indeterminate growth and 
And as you advance, as the plants advance, they, the lower leaves start senescing and the top uh, layer or the crown layer keeps producing photosynthesis as shown in the blue dots here versus the red dots. So what is the purpose of this? The purpose of this was to test whether the transgene what we introduced, is it affecting the photosynthesis rate in the plants? As we see the, for example, one through 45 are the transgenic plants and 45 to 50, they are pretty much uh, behaving the same way or showing the same response with reference to photosynthesis. So it's suggesting that the transgene is no way interfering with the na natural and normal metabolic pathways of the plants. So here are the plants at the maturity level, and then you go collect all the manually harvest these plants and then collect the cotton, gin, and look at uh, gin, and then look at the fiber and the seed quantity and uh, in order to compare. Again, if the objective is the same, whether the transgene is affecting any of the outcome of the plant, that is in this case, it is fiber and the seed. As we can see, we tested them in groups of five, as well as combined data. So what it shows is that when we looked at the number of bowls harvested from plants, uh, the transgenics two here at the first two bar scales show that these are the transgenics showing a little improved bowl number, uh, which is statistically significant. Whereas when we take into consideration the seed and the fiber, that disappears. So what it means is that the number of bowls may be produced more, but the number of seeds inside is probably is compromised. Uh, so when you have more bowls with fewer seeds, smaller number of bowls, but more seeds, they all compensate to one another. So there is no statistical significance and the transgene what we are looking at is not interfering any way in, in affecting negatively the plants. So this is another uh, experiment to look at the seed and oil content in the transgenic progenies. Here are the T2 progenies from 1 to 45, and then the last five are the non-transgenic controls, where we are looking at the average protein and oil of the individual plants. And what we are seeing is here, uh, there is no, there's not much of a difference between the controls and the transgenics. Again, suggesting that there is no uh, negative effect of the transgene on the plant protein and the oil contents. This is, this oil measurement and protein measurement is done non-destructively using TDM, TDNMR method, which is, uh, which does not involve any chemical extraction of the oils and proteins. Okay, so when we combine all those data and look at what happens is they are pretty much the same in the sense that the average protein content, oil content, and the seeds, number of seeds, what they produce are very, very similar or pretty much identical. So suggesting that the transgene what we have introduced to, into cotton has not affected the cotton, uh, either protein, oil, or the yield parameters. Here is the cotton embryos. What we do is we check, we confirm the plants that they are producing, they are, they, there is a transgene in them by PCR confirmation. We also confirm them through oil and protein analysis and uh, also compare the yields. And then we wanted to look what the gene product that is we are expecting it to make tocotrienols. So whether they are making it tocotrienols, that, how we could know that? We could know that only when we analyze the embryo contents. The oil uh, is stored in the seeds or the embryos. In this case, in cotton, it is the embryos. So the interesting fact about that in cotton is that in, in majority of the endosperms, the endosperm takes the major part of the seed. The embryo is usually smaller because the uh, 
the endosperm nourishes the embryo, but in this case, the endosperm is modified into a small layer on the seed coat. So the major portion of the seed in cotton is the embryo, what is shown here. So we sent those, our samples to our collaborator, Dr. Kahun uh, at the University of Nebraska. You all remember that the construct of this HGT came from Kahun's lab. So we sent these samples to Dr. Kahun. They are experts in analysis of the tocotrienols and tocopherols in plants. So they did run HPLC experiments. This is high performance liquid chromatography experiments or where they could demonstrate, where they could see that the cotton plants with non-transformed, uh, non-transformed trans coker plants showing no change, only producing tocopherols as expected. Whereas the transgenic plants showing a massive amount of tocotrienols in them, especially in the form of gamma and a small amounts of alpha and delta tocotrienols. And without affecting the tocopherol content in the embryos. So we analyzed all this uh, tocotrienol content in these plants over three generations of plants. And here are the tabulations of those. And then showing that as expected, coca, which is a non-transgenic plant showing absolutely no zero tocotrienols whereas uh, tocopherols, as usual, the transgenics as well as the wild type showing the same similar amounts. So this has boost, this, the trienol accumulation in these transgenics boosted over two to three times accumulation of vitamin E or tocotrienol plus tocopherol. This is uh, advanced stages of plants. And as we advanced the plants, we also conducted a field study in Southern Texas where plants were grown in a one acre of area and with the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture's permit. And then we conducted the field trial to bulk up the seeds and then look into the oil contents, how, the, how it is uh, accumulated in the oils, not just embryos. So what we could see is that this is over three generations, the seeds producing, these are the T4 seeds producing almost three times more than the uh, wild type, the tocotrienols. What we have here is again, always running the uh, control showing zero tocotrienols and then tocopherols as usual, as expected normal numbers. It is the same graphic presentation of the same da data here, uh, where we see uh, two to three times vitamin E in the transgenics, uh, whereas in the coker, which is the black box, black bar here, showing only one third of the vitamin total E, and then absolutely no tocotrienols, that is a T3, tocotrienols, no tocotrienols, whereas only tocopherols, whereas the transgenics plant showing accumulation of over three times vitamin E, that is tocopherol plus tocotrienols. So from the field experiment, what we got, what we got is a lot of seeds. A lot of seeds have to be sent out to a bigger laboratory where they could extract, refine, and bleach the oil, cotton oil, and advance it for further studies. Here are our collaborators, Dr. Michael Dowd from USDA RS lab in New Orleans. And he extracted, bleached, and uh, sent us back the oils. And then we analyzed those as well with the help of Dr. Cowan's lab. And then again, in the oil, it is pretty much the same as what we saw in the embryos which is accumulation of more and more tocotrienols in the final stage. So one more experiment that we wanted to look at is, this is how tocotrienols and tocopherols are accumulated in the embryo. Here is a MALDI experiment uh, showing that this is uh, showing 
uh, how in real time where they are, where these tocopherols and tocotrienols are accumulated in the embryo. So for example, tocopherol is common to all because tocopherol exists in the cotton plants, whereas tocotrienol does not exist in the non-trendrenic. And uh, tocopherol here is common among all the transgenic as well as the wild type plants. What we see here is the tocopherol accumulating, especially in the embryogenic axis and uh, tocotrienols completely absent in the wild type, whereas distributed all over the embryos in the transgenics alone, transgenics only. So gossypol is another chemical that is a, that's a toxic substance located in the glands of the seeds called uh, gossypol glands. So these glands are not affected by the accumulation of the tocotrienols or tocopherols. Okay, another experiment, what we wanted to know that we know that tocopherols are powerful antioxidants. So in order to do that, what we did is an experiment here uh, to look at the antioxidant activity. This is a simple, simple test where you do uh, assay uh, for the antioc antioxidant activity. Uh, what we saw at the end of the day is that uh, there is a significant improvement in the antioxidant activity from the tissue lysates of the uh, transgenics versus the wild type, which is almost double. So showing that uh, the tocotrienols accumulated in these seeds have been uh, powerful antioxidant, giving extra powerful antioxidant capacity to these transgenic plants. Similarly, uh, we also looked at the uh, we also looked at the oxidative stability of the seed oils. So this is the these uh, oils uh, extracted from the field grown plants was commercially analyzed at the Iowa Central Fuel Testing Laboratory. Uh, and what we could see is that there was a 27% improved oxidative stability index in uh, transgenics over the coker line that is the white type non transgenic suggesting that this oil has a potential for giving extended life, lifetime and extended shelf life for the transgenic oils. Okay, so this is the, almost the end of the presentation here. What we are looking at is, is the shikimate pathway. Shikimate pathway exists only in plants in the production of tocotrienols and tocopherols because tocopherols and tocotrienols are produced only in plants because it is the machinery exists in the plastics. So animals or humans lack those. So it has to be only in the plant, manufactured in the, synthesized in the plant. So what we see here is the left side of the left side of the pathway that is accumulation of tocopherols exists naturally in cotton. Whereas the line shown in the red here, this side of the pathway lacks, is lacking in cotton. So by introducing the barley gene, that is HVHGGT, we were able to transform the cotton plants produced in order to make tocotrienols. So this pathway has been introduced. So our, this is the first time ever we have been ably successfully able to demonstrate and show the functionality of the HVGGT in cotton. Okay, so in order to come to the last slide of my talk, that is summary and conclusions, we produce transgenic cotton plants and then we advance them through T4 generations, transgenic cotton embryos, they accumulated high quantities of gamma tocotrienols and a small but almost equal quantities of alpha and delta tocotrienols. And in hirsutum, we know that non-transgenic embryos are completely lacking tocotrienols. And 
in transgenic plants, alpha and gamma tocopherols were, are detected roughly in equal quantities and also accumulated in, uh, also the additional production of accumulation of tocotrienols in transgenic embryos resulted in heritable two to threefold increase in vitamin E content when compared to non-transgenic cocoa. There is no negative impact of the transgene on growth, development, photosynthesis rate, yield, or seed characteristic as far as the transgenics are concerned. And what we did with the MALDI experiments showed that uh, alpha tocopherols were mostly localized in the cartilary tissues, and the gamma tocopherols were mostly localized in the embryonic axis tissues, both in wild type and the transgenic seeds. By contrast, newly generated gamma tocotrienols were produced only in transgenic embryos, and, but relatively distributed uniformly throughout all seed tissues or the embryonic tissues. So improved antioxidant activity is evident in HGGT, uh, T4 compared to cocoa plants, and embryo lysate showed uh, two-fold increased antioxidant activity in, co in comparison to coca. What we have is oxidative stability index, again, refined bleach oils showing 27% uh, improved oxidative stability in transgenics uh, in comparison to the coca. What we have is we have elevated tocochromanol content that may provide extra stability and extended shelf life for the transgenic cotton seed oil. And with the annual production of cotton seed about 43 million metric tons in 2019, tocotrienol producing transgenic pres transgenics present a significant potential source for tocotrienols that could be recovered from the distillate fractions produced during crude cotton seed oil refining. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge the people connected with this project. Uh, this is me. I do cotton transformations and then analysis and then all the uh, genotyping and things like that. And then Trevor, Trevor helped us in analyzing the Baldi. Uh, Ken Chapman is the director of our uh, biodiscovery and he is the principal investigator of this project. Uh, Dr. Cahoon is in uh, University of Nebraska. His graduate student, Anji and uh, Wei Zhang from China, they were able to uh, analyze our samples for tocotrienol and tocopherol contents. Michael Dowd, Dr. Michael Dowd was uh, the person inside, uh, behind uh, extraction of the oils and Dr. Kater Haig and Thomas Wed Gartner are the uh, cotton incorporated people who have shown continuous interest in this project and they are the financial supporters of, of this project. And with this, I end my presentation. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. So I'm audible, sir? Uh, yes, uh, oh. but I'm unable to see. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. There's a question from uh, mm -hmm. Dr. M. Punuraj. His question is, can we incorporate the tocochromonols in other plants through a technique called as biofortification? Uh, 
I want to know, uh, is that a method to, because I have not heard about that method, I would like to know what it is used for and if it is uh, the usual and the common method is to transformation of the plants. Okay, sir. Second question. Mm -hmm. Will the genetically modified plants mm -hmm. reproduce or they remain as it is? As like that of normal plants in the second day generation or so? Uh, I showed I showed the data that we generated the transgenic plants, advanced them from generation T1 through all the way to T4. There is absolutely no negative effect on the yield of the plants. There is no negative effect on any of the protein and oil accumulations. And the seeds continue to be absolutely normal with growth, germination, germination, growth, development, every aspect of it. So I do not see any negative effect of the transgene on these plants as far as the advanced generations are concerned. Okay, sir. Next question. Yes. Is there any difference between the medicinal value of naturally occurring plants and genetically modified plants? It and is can you differentiate them? It is essentially the same chemical you are trying to produce. For example, barley gene that we put into cotton, it naturally produces tocotrienols. So the end product is the same. There is absolutely no difference between when you transfer it through genetic transformation or whether it is producing naturally. The chemical is the same. The end product is the same. Okay, sir. There's one more question. These genetically modified crops, are they resistant to the disease, pest, and drought? This is a very complex question in the sense that we are, all the, the parameters you're asking about, they are all governed by individual genes. So for example, disease resistance. Okay, so there are multiple genes responsible for the disease resistance factor. So introducing a foreign gene Yes, sometimes it could alter impact, but in our case, it did not do any you know, negative effect. So based on that, I say that you cannot expect one gene to alter everything, do all good, but certainly it is not doing any negative. Okay, sir. Next one. What is the use of increasing vitamin E in cotton? As I said, the last the last conclusion of my summary and conclusion that we produce a lot of cotton oil. So vitamin E is an important source for human health. So when we have so much of oil, we grow cotton plants. So for example, we grow in millions and millions of acres. So when we are extracting oil from the cotton plants, there is so much of oil. In addition, you have tocotrienol supplemented with it, certainly it will be another product to use for. So there's one last question here. Yes. What must be the age of the plant wherein we get maximum concentration of tocotrienol? tocotrienols? Uh, see, this is a expression of the gene only in seed, embryo, okay? So say for example, there are a lot of experiments done where these are accumulated. Yes. Tocotrienols do not occur all over, only specific, but they do not occur in the same as tocopherols. Tocopherols occur all over the plant body, whereas tocotrienols mostly in the latex or the seeds. So suggesting that it is at the, most of the experiments and the review or the reviewers, they say that uh, the tocotrienol and tocopherol accumulation occurs at the fag end of the plant life. That is when they are yes. going through senescence. Yes, okay. yes. So, so it means that it is mostly in the fag end of the plant life. And 
Uh, in case of tocotrienols, these are what we tried is these are very seed specific and naturally they occur only in the seeds. As we show it in barley, as we show it in uh, Arabidopsis, as we see it in other plants as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I have, I have one question. Uh, Sorry, interruption. Yes. Yes. Dr. Shanma. Yes. Uh, how best the vitamin E and these tocotrienols can be used in disease management, especially with heart ailments? Yes, that's uh, that's a good question. As I said in the introduction, that I'm not a nutritional biologist or a medicinal practitioner, but certainly that these are being you know uh, evaluated, and then the people are recognizing in the medical field that they play a very very crucial role. And what content, what dosage you need to use them, I don't know but certainly they play a very, very important role. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Here we end up with the question answer session. Okay. I just go for small announcement. After that, the validity session. Now that we have come to an end of the webinar, we will be providing you all the feedback link to your registered email IDs. Only upon successful submission of feedback form, e-certificate of participation will be sent to the registered email ID. Kindly make sure that email IDs provided in the form are correctly written. Also see that name of the participant and institution name to be filled in the feedback are correct as it will be printed in the certificate in the same manner. So we are very glad to have you all today, sir. Now we move on to the last part of the webinar, vote of thanks by Professor Ms. M. S. Bali. Over to you, madam. Once again, good evening, sir, over there in Texas, and good day to all others participating in our international webinar. I would like to quote, the best view comes after the hardest climb, unquote. I feel honored to express my deep sense of gratitude to our alumnus, Dr. Shanmuk Salimat, for putting forth his views in a methodical way about the importance of tocotrienols to us. At this hour, at midnight, you have taken time off for us, sir. We wholeheartedly thank you, sir, on behalf of Cayley Society's Aral Science Institute, Principal, staff, thank you, sir. We would like to profusely thank our principal, Dr. V. D. Elmery, for his support and guidance. Thank you, sir. We would express our gratitude to Professor R. R. Wadagami, IQAC coordinator, Dr. P. B. Bendigeri, head of Department of Botany, my colleagues in the department. Thank you, each and every one. Technical teams from computer science department and other departments deserve a special mention and thanks to for sparing their time whenever we were in need of. We thank the co-host, Dr. Vinay Kumar sir, Sushma Kati madam, Megha Galgali madam, Priyanka Kamath madam. We would like to convey our gratitude to our one more alumnus who is live streaming with us for this session. Dr. Vishnupan Misale for joining us. Thank you, sir. One cannot overlook the overwhelming response we have got from 14 countries. We take this opportunity to thank each one of you of the 2044 participants collectively and individually. Thank you, one and all. Lastly, I thank the non-teaching staff and the, all those who have contributed up to this hour to run the international webinar successfully. Thank you, everyone. Take care and good day. Good night, Dr. Shadmo. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you good all. Night, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you and goodbye. Sir. The session you, gets sir. over. Mr. Sir, thank, thank, you. thank you. Namaste. Session ends here. Okay, thank you. Madam, one of the excellent uh, webinar. Yeah. Sir, you were saying something? 
sir um, uh, madam i just wanted to thank you all for uh, one of the excellent uh, webinar i heard in the recent times and uh, it uh, generated lot of interest and then i could uh, go through the internet about this toko uh, and all and only one thing was that uh, there are alpha beta gamma and uh, delta type uh, uh, toko train all in which yes. gamma is uh, said to be having the lot of metabolic activity and alpha and beta are not having like that or they have, have reduced the, this thing this particular mechanism what gm uh, this is told whether it is leading to gamma uh, type of uh, tocotrienol was one of the question and but then the last slide showed that from gamma again they are coming to alpha okay so how it is happening one thing second question my was that whether it will increase the fiber production or no that was the in the cotton and the other than that the one <laughs> apprehension was okay. that the uh, the rajiv jikshit sir uh, he used to tell advocate that the cotton seed oil and vanaspati oil is not good for a human consumption uh, and also he used to mention that uh, the uh, other oils like palm oil is also not good for health and the, that also contains this toko tray you know so we should study as sir was telling about the nutritional value of this and then metabolism of this particular uh, system should be uh, studied further and the correct thing should come out definitely that in this some method the research is great research to tell that uh, yes is we can make it like that so it is a wonderful thing and uh, i am very very happy about and also thankful to you as well as uh, elamali sir and the are your co-host vijay kumar bharti madam every one of you it's an excellent yes. thing and then please continue and uh, make it uh, make it happen so thank you thank you very much thank, thank you sir thank you anand sir pleasure i just joined us and added uh, most of yes. the points thank you sir very great thing and please continue sir uh, sure, yes sir. sure sir i would like to uh, think of uh, doing some work with zoology department as well what we wanted to study is the recently locust infestation is coming with uh, in our country yeah yeah sir yes sir so to alleviate that one whether we can do some ultrasonic studies like that was the question in the sense uh, if we change the frequency of the sound waves how mm -hmm. does this locust behave whether yeah. they will be repelled by this would like to uh, make an uh, effort to study so i thought that if that uh, can be done as a research in zoology department by uh, making the locusts of different types and then there is an ultrasonic production and how they behave whether they will repel like that even though it is out of context oh. here this particular thing uh, you can uh, uh, give some thought to zoology yeah. department as well whether yeah. this ultrasonic uh, energy or the sound energy of different frequencies can repel these particular insects like that Yes sir. Yes, yes sir. Definitely yeah. we'll get to that. Ah, thank you sir. Thank you for uh, igniting a new idea. Thank you. Sir. Very great day for me. Thank you very much. Yes. Sir. So I need to come to zoology. <laughs>